Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, and welcome to this next class in the uh, class of Matthew. Uh, we're going to be starting in Matthew chapter 5 today, and today I want to get through a good bit of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, the Sermon on the Mount is a very meaty teaching uh, by Jesus, of course, on uh, a mountain. He, he teaches this Sermon on a Mountain, which is why it's called the Sermon on the Mount. I know, pretty crazy. Uh, and man, it is just jam-packed with information. He's just moving on from one thing to the next, giving them uh, tip and tip and tip uh, and, and commandment, command, commandment, commandment, however you want to put it. He's just giving them teachings over and over and over again. Uh, some of them are kind of connected to the others. Some of them uh, kind of might seem disjointed. And, and we'll talk a little bit about that. My goal for this is for you guys to really understand what's being taught. And because there's so much being taught in such a short time, what I will do is make these classes short. Uh, I'm going to give you guys the, the blessings of, of the, the kindness of my heart. Because we're, we're still in quarantine. This is getting tough. You know, I, I don't blame you guys for not wanting to watch a 30-minute impersonal video because it's not like when we're in class and hanging out together and you know we can see each other high five each other uh, this is different so I'm, I want to keep this a little bit shorter I want you guys to spend some time uh, actually digesting this information but if you will do me a favor since I'm going to do my best to keep this class a little bit shorter I ask you that to really really grasp this stuff to pull out a Bible, whether it's a Bible on your phone, whether it's a physical Bible, pull out a Bible and, and let your eyes read along to this stuff with me. Uh, I promise you it will help you. You will be able to digest more of this information and more of it will be committed to memory. So what I want to do is start in chapter 5, read a little bit, talk a little bit, read a little bit, talk a little bit, and uh, after a few minutes of doing that, I will let the lesson be yours. And uh, we, we will, of course, talk about it Wednesday night at 7 o'clock if you can join us. So let's begin in Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountains, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. Just setting up the scene. He went up on a mountain because there's crowds. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the poor, pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Nine Beatitudes here are given uh, blessings. Here, when, when you hear the words, um, blessed are, I just want you to think happy um, or, or goodwill uh, or Happy, yeah, happiness is probably the, the best way to put it. Um, he's saying these people are happy. Happy are the pure in spirit. Why are they happy? Because they will see God. Happy are the peacemakers. Why? Because they will be called sons of God. That's why they're, they're blessed. Uh, on, on, what's the word that I'm thinking of? Often. Often we think of blessings as like these material blessings that we get. You know, my phone is a blessing that was given to me. Um, water is a blessing that was given to me. We, we think of blessings like physical stuff, but blessings just mean something good that happened to you uh, and often is connected with happiness. And so he's just saying these people are happy and gives reasons why they're happy. Um, I could spend days on the Beatitudes talking. Uh, I, I don't think that would be um, a, a a good way to go through this because we would take forever. So I'm just going to move on from that. If you have any questions, uh, write them down, save them for class. Verse 13, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. 
In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. You are salt and light, and very simply that means that your job is to bring focus, to bring attention to God, to bring attention to Jesus. Salt is a flavor that you notice when you're eating food, and in the same way, in a dark room, you will notice a light. Those are the two things that we are told to be because we are told to uh, show the world who God is. But we can't do that if, if our light is being covered up, and especially if we're covering up our own light. Or if our saltiness has lost its flavor, it's not, not salty anymore, you know, we've kind of lost steam, we're, we're, not, we're not living our life as a Christian kind of like, like we should, its saltiness isn't working anymore. So we can't be hiding that light, we, we can't be hiding it, uh, and, and we can't lose our saltiness. If we want to serve God and bring light and uh, focus on to Him, we got to remain salty, we got to remain lit. All right. It's funny, both the words salty and lit have different connotations now because if something is lit, it's like, it's awesome, and if something is salty, they're like mad, but I'm completely using salty and lit in completely different ways, so I hope you guys understand all the terminology. We'll work on that. All right, verse 17. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Very simply, people were kind of expecting Jesus to come and throw the rule book out. They had all these laws that they were supposed to do, uh, and they had all these prophecies that they expected to be fulfilled, and they thought the uh, Messiah was, some of them thought, thought that the Messiah was going to not fulfill them. In fact, his enemies, which in the book of Matthew really seems to be the Pharisees, these Pharisees uh, are accusing him of not following the law of Moses and, and not uh, fulfilling those prophecies. And Jesus is saying, look, I'm not going to ignore the law, and I'm not going to ignore the prophecies. In fact, I came because of the law and the prophecies. I'm here to fulfill the law and the prophecies. And he tells the people, don't just think because you are a follower of me that you're all good. You have to still be righteous. He says, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. And that's a big deal because the scribes and the Pharisees, they were known for following the law so well that they added extra laws for themselves so that, that, that they could follow the law even better than before. Man, they it, it, to, to be more righteous than the scribes and the Pharisees at this time, that's a big deal. Jesus is telling the people, he's telling us, look, you can't just coast and say that because you know Jesus... You're, you're going to heaven no matter what you do. No, 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 no. That's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what Jesus teaches. Righteousness should be a result of our salvation. And our righteousness should surpass the scribes and the Pharisees. Words of Jesus say, if it doesn't, we will never enter the kingdom of heaven. That's pretty scary. All right. Continuing on in verse 21. <sighs> Excuse me. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly, I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Here we're going to start a section that's going to continue throughout the rest of chapter 5 uh, and, and all that we'll talk about today. And, and he's going to say, you have heard that it was said this, but I say this. He brings up something that is said in the law. And he's going to say how he changes it a little bit. He says, so here he says, you've heard that uh, it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. He's not changing that law. It still is bad to murder. But he is saying, look, that's, I'm going to take it one step further, because some of you guys are proud that you haven't murdered. 
you know, walking around puffed up. You know, I haven't murdered anybody today, so I must be a pretty good Christian. You know what? I haven't murdered anybody either recently, but that doesn't necessarily make me a good person. How many non-murderers do you know that are still awful people? So Jesus is saying, you've heard that it was said don't murder, but I'm going to add, don't even be angry. What? Don't be angry? But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. <laughs> See, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is going to use hyperbole a little bit. Uh, what I believe to be hyperbole, where he, he exaggerates a little bit. He's going to say something really significant, but he doesn't necessarily mean it all the way, but he's doing it to prove a point. Some people believe that he's not exaggerating and that he really means don't be angry at all or you'll be liable to judgment. I think he's just trying to prove a point. We're really going to see that in this next section. Verse 27. You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Here he says something obvious. You've heard that it was said, don't commit adultery. All right, that's easy. Easier for some than others, but, but it's relatively easy not, not to commit adultery. But now he's going to add one step further. Don't even lust after someone. Don't even think those thoughts about someone. And then he teaches you, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out. If your arm causes you to sin, rip it off. And this is where I think he's being uh, hyperbolic. I think he's, he's exaggerating. There's your big word for the video, hyperbolic. Uh, I think he's exaggerating. I, I don't think if you sin with your right eye, you should tear it out. Because very quickly, we would probably tear out both of our eyes and our tongue the next time we said something evil, and our ears the next time we listened to something bad, and our arms. And we would become a vegetable. We would, we, there would be nothing left of us. But he has a point. Because we do need to cut something out sometimes. We do need to cut off these things because it's better to cut off something than go to heaven. So how about this? If your phone is causing you to sin, get rid of it. You can still live your life without a phone. And it's better to live your life without a phone than to use your phone for all the 60, 70, 80, 90 years you live on earth and go to hell. You choose. You know, do you want your phone or do you want heaven? Uh, it's a pretty choice when it's given to us like that. And that's all Jesus is saying. Look, cut this stuff out. It's better for you to go without that than to go to hell. So if you're scrolling through Twitter, if you're a Twitter person, I like Twitter, um, but if you, you find that sometimes on, on Twitter, some people uh, like some Im images or retweet some images that you really ought not to be looking at, well, maybe you should get rid of Twitter. You'll get rid of something that, that, that you really like, but it keeps you from sinning. Stuff like that. It's different for everybody, so I don't want to give too many examples. Hopefully you have an idea of what that is in your life. That's what Jesus is teaching. All right, verse 31. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the grounds of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So Moses gave this... Uh, addendum to the law. An addendum is kind of an addition to the law that, that says if somebody wants to get divorced, he, he can. They just give a certificate of divorce. And, and that was done because the hearts of the people were so evil. But Jesus is saying, no, that's not what it's meant to be. Marriage is meant to be forever. So unless there's sexual immorality, divorce is not okay. And he says it in very clear terms. Verse 33, again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord that you what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is the footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than that comes from evil. All he's saying here is, those, those people who always say, I swear, I swear I'm going to do this. I, I, I promise on, on my, my mama's head, I'm, I'm going to do this. He says, you should be such 
honorable, commendable people that when you say yes, you mean yes. No ifs, ands, or buts. If you say yes, you mean yes. If you say no, you mean no. And that's a good teaching. If you tell someone yes, you're going to do something, you better follow, follow through with it. If you tell someone no, you're not going to do something, you better follow through with it. That's what being yes, having your yes be your yes and your no be your no means. It means that you're going to follow through. I'm getting a call, but it's a spam call. Sorry about that. It means you're going to follow through with what you said you would do. Second to last section, verse 38. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. That was kind of a teaching, an eye for an eye or tooth for tooth. If somebody hurts you in your right eye, you get to hurt them in their right eye. If someone slaps you in your right cheek, you get to slap them on the right cheek. Jesus is saying, if you're going to be a Christian, you got to be forgiving. All right? So if someone makes you go one mile with them, go with them too. I wish I could take the time to tell you the story behind that, but I want to get through this and, and like, like I told you guys at the start, just get, give you a shorter video and some time to digest it. Verse 43, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good and send rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Here he's saying, people usually say, love your enemies, or love your neighbors, hate your enemies. He's saying, love your enemies. If you love your neighbors, what good is that? Everybody loves those who loves them. All right, if somebody gives you a donut every day, and you're very nice to them, what, what are you proving? Of course you're going to be nice to someone who gives you a donut every day. All right, now if someone slaps you on the cheek every day, and you're nice to them, now that's proving something. That's proving that you can be forgiving like God is forgiving. That's proving godliness. That's proving like you're being more perfect, like your Heavenly Father is perfect. That's why he ends that section saying, be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. Look, do what your Heavenly Father is doing. Our Heavenly Father forgives us. And I've done a whole lot more wrong to him than a lot of people have done to me. You know, someone will, will be in my life for two months and, and do a few wrong things to me and, and I act like it's the biggest deal. And I, I act like it's the end of the world. I can never forgive that person. Look, I'm 23 years old and for 23 years I have uh, done a lot of things that I, I should not have done. A lot of things that God has told me not to do. And I've, I, I have nothing to answer for that. I have no way to make up for that other than by the blood of Jesus. He has forgiven me of all that. I can forgive somebody else. Love your enemies, not just your friends. It's easy to love your friends. It's easy to love your boyfriends and girlfriends and close friends and best friends. It's, it's easy to love all them. Love those who it's harder for you to love. All right. Well, I'll leave that to you. That's Matthew chapter 5. That's the first of the three chapters of the Sermon on the Mount. I went a little bit longer than I'd hoped, but I hope you guys will have some time to digest that. And I hope you will uh, join us for class uh, Wednesday night. I hope you like, comment, and subscribe. I said that just for you, Andrew.